So I'd like to ask um, Kari Stephenson to come up and um, give us his first talk. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's enjoy. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the organizer for inviting me to com come and tell you a little bit about decode genetics. And it could probably be, be argued that decode, the decode genetics cohort was the first one to be assembled to do the kind of hypothesis free population genetics that is standard in the field today. And we started this 20 years ago or in the fall of, of uh, 1996. And it was, uh, to say the least, a somewhat difficult enterprise to begin with. Today we have chip genotyped about uh, half of the population, about 170,000 individuals. We have genotyped about 600,000 people of, from other countries. We started to do whole genome sequencing in 2010, and we have whole genome sequenced about 85,000 people. Uh, we can uh, fairly easily impute uh, sequence variants down to 0.1% allelic frequency into the genotypes. And we can genotype into re uh, close relatives of the genotype with reasonable accuracy, and, and we, so we have an insight into, some insight into the genome of about 390,000 Icelanders. And now we have started to layer on the top of that other data sets like RNA-seq, and, and the most recent is, is we have the measurement of about 5,000 proteins in the plasma of 40,000 Icelanders. We have very, very rich phenotypic data. We have about data on about 600 diseases and about 10,000 quantitative traits out of the healthcare system and from elsewhere. And keeping in mind that what we call diseases in, is in most instances a perturbation of physiological function, we have started a fairly large phenotypic effort. We have now phenotyped about 13,000 Icelanders. We call them into our phenotyping center. We are recruiting them on the basis of of sequence variants or variants in the sequence. And it takes them about, each one of them, about four and a half hours. And it's g giving us an extraordinarily, extraordinarily deep, uh, very, very high granulite data on physiological function. We're looking at cognitive function, voice, smell, hearing, eyes, uh, exercise tolerance test, and, and uh, bone mineral density, and stuff like that. Uh, we have over the past 23 years made a, a significant contribution to this discovery of common variants in the sequence that associate with all kinds of phenotypes. And actually, we have been of late fairly successful in finding rare variants with very large effect that uh, associates with all kinds of common diseases and, and uh, other phenotypes. And probably one of the reasons for that success is the founder effect in the Icelandic population. Uh, I'm just going to give you one example of how the work we have done in Iceland has changed the view of a clinical phenotype, and that is in the, in, that's in atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is the most common sustained cardiac arrhythmia uh, man. The lifetime risk is about 25%, and it is the most common condition that predisposes to stroke which is the most common cause of disability in our society, so this is of huge public health and clinical importance. In 2003, the first variant was found, the uh, first gene was with variant was found to associate with risk of atrial fibrillation, and it was in KCN21, in potassium channel gene. And since then, about 30 vari variants have been found in about 30 genes that confer large, set to confer large risk of atrial fibrillation, almost all of them have been in ion channels. And by the way, almost all of these are false positive associations, almost all of them based on the candidate gene approach. We published our first paper on atrial fibrillation in 2007, where we found variants by the PITEX2 gene, which is a still a transcription factor gene, that has an impact on the structure of the heart, has, has nothing to do with ion channels. And since then, we have found rare variants in a large number of genes that, that make cytoplasmic uh, components 
light components of the sarcomere, the myosin heavy chain 16 was first of them, myosin light chain type 4 was, was the second, and since then have been piling up, and this is not a comp uh, comprehensive list which is on these slides. So today, atrial fibrillation isn't anymore an ion channel gene. It's an expression of a subtle uh, atrial cardiomyopathy. And the consequence of that is that even when you, when you manage to, to prevent the cardiac arrhythmia with ablation, the patient is kept on, on anticoagulation because it isn't the arrhythmia, but the cardiomyopathy that predisposes to, to um, the thromboembolic stroke from the heart. Uh, we have, of late, started to expand the data set that we use, take the Iceland founder population and put it in the context of other populations. And we have now access to data on about 1.6 million people, and we hope we will have up to 2.5 million people by 2025. And these are populations from the United States. We count among these individuals the access to the UK Biobank, which in my mind is the most noble and most interesting enterprise in biomedical research ever. Uh, and this is just an example of a paper that we published last year by combining uh, the Icelandic data with the UK Biobank data. But I'm going to end by telling you one story that is supposed to demonstrate to you that it isn't enough just to expand the number of individuals you have access to, expand the number of populations you can w work with, looking at variants in the genome that associate with, with uh, the probability of a phenotype, but it's also extremely important to begin to layer separate data sets on the top of each other. So we have started to do uh, RNA-seq, which has a uh, transformed our, our ability to develop an understanding of the meaning of associations. And we have, of late, started to look at proteins. And we have now a measurement of 5,000 proteins in plasma from 40,000 Icelanders. So we can mine them as a population data set. And the example I want to give you comes from, from you know, they are actually comes from looking at autoimmune thyroid disease. Uh, where we are combining Hashimoto's, Graves, uh, hypothyroidism, according to ICD-10, uh, and the use of, of thyroid medications. And actually, we pulled out 100 sequence variants that associate significantly with autoimmune thyroiditis. Thereof, 80 are, are novel. Of them, 43 have never been associated with any uh, immunological phenomenon and 19 of them are coding sequence variants. The one that stands out as the most important one, or the one with the biggest effect, is the variant in the FLT3, or the FLM-related tyrosine kinase 3, eh, that associates, that confers an odds ratio of about 1.5, autoimmune thyroiditis, and also associates with other antibody-positive inflammatory diseases, like it associates with antibody-positive rheumatoid arthritis, but not antibody-negative uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. When we then looked at the impact of this variant, the RS764, on, on, uh, on uh, RNA expression, we did not find any effect on the amount of expression, but we found uh, uh, an impact on form. Basically, this variant which is in, a, in an intro, which generates a new splice site that lead to abnormal splicing, inclusion of, of an intronic sequence, leading to a stop coating, generating a truncated protein, missing the very important kinase domain. So here is how we taking it from an association between variant and sequence with a disease to show that this variant, even though it is an intronic variant, that it the, it dramatically affects the structure of the protein. It's a loss of function mutation. The next thing we then did is that we took the same variant and we asked the question: On what, on the, on, uh, what is the protein? What are the proteins with concentrations that in plasma that are in the biggest influence of RS764? And actually, it affects the concentration of a very significant number 
of ARV proteins, they all of them have something to do with the immune system, but the one that is on the biggest is under the biggest influence of the sequence variant is the lichen for the FLT3. And, and it increases it by about 0.6 to 7 standard deviation. So you have a sequence variant in an intron of a gene that affects splicing, becomes a loss of function mutation, generates a truncated protein that is missing a, a tyrosine kinase domain. And the variant has an effect on the concentration of the lichen for the receptor that is encoded by the gene. So how does it have that impact? It is simply, it is possible that it is uh, constitute a compensation for the loss of, of, a, of a, the, the receptor. So basically, if you look at, if you look at this, this um, if you look at the total story, we have an increased risk of autoimmune thyroiditis by this variant. There is an increased risk of other antibody positive autoimmune diseases, no surprise because of well-known overlap between these diseases. It causes an increased monocyte count, generation of new splice out, abnormal splicing leading to a truncated protein, and higher, a higher concentration of the lichen for the receptor encoded by the gene. It is an interesting because uh, activating somatic mutations in the FLT3 uh, have been shown to cause acute myelogenous leukemia. So one thing is for sure, uh, even though this story is, in my mind, being child, uh, childishly fascinated by everything that that has to do with genetics is a, is a very, very beautiful story and takes us very far to explaining the impact of the variant. It is never going to be used for a drug target because you don't want to activate FLT3 because activation of FLT3 has been shown to lead to AML. And one interesting thing is that the inhibitors of FLT3 that have been used to treat AML, they lead to inflammatory cell infiltrates in various organs as a, as a side effect. Uh, so I'm giving you this example, just showing you what I believe is awaiting us once we begin to, to uh, gather large amount of data sets like this. But to make this work, it is impossible to gather just, measure just these proteins in the plasma of individual with specific diseases. You need to have it at a sort of a population level where you can mine the proteomics in the same way as you're mining the, the genetics, you're mining this as a, in a hypothesis independent manner. So I have given you a tiny, tiny little insight sort of into where we have been in our history and, and uh, where we are going. And just like, just like the rest of you, I think that the, what we will be able to do over the next few years is going to be heavily dependent on how we can integrate our work with the work of the rest of the community. This is, you know, we, you know, we live on an island, but we aren't an island. We are working in a very, very close collaboration with the rest of the world. We have extraordinarily large collaboration with with Denmark, we have a big collaboration with, with Norway, we have a big collaboration with Sweden. We have an increasing, extraordinarily good collaboration with, with uh, Mark Daly and Arno Paluti in Finland. And we have even been known to collaborate with the Americans. <laughs> Don't quote me on this. <laughs> But, but no, eh, honestly, I think that, that um, I think that the future of the, all of this is going to depend on how we how we develop a, a large collaborative enterprise, and, and uh, gatherings like this, I hope, is going to foster something like that. Thank you. Great, thank you, and uh, thank you for keeping so well to time. Um, so, 
Um, Nancy, Nancy Cox is going to come up and um, take the next talk. While we're just changing over talks, if there are any points of clarification, um, now is a good time to raise them. But as I said, we'll keep discussion till the discussion session at the end. Um, but Nancy, come on up. Thanks. It's such a pleasure to be here with so many of my friends and colleagues. And thus, um, my talk on specifically on BioView, the biobank at Vanderbilt University, um, is more or less uh, uh, relevant to a lot of the biobanks in the United States that use electronic health records for their phenotype. Um, so BioView, we have uh, specimens in about 285,000 samples, so DNA uh, available on about 285,000 samples. And right now, our entire phenome comes from electronic health records. Um, we're working on ways to allow patients to input um, other kinds of information through the health, My Health at Vanderbilt portal, um, which is something, for example, that at Geisinger is already possible to do. There are a number of um, other biobanks in the US that have this general model of DNA samples linked to electronic health records with omics, so uh, Geisinger and Kaiser Permanente uh, at, as um, health maintenance organizations with these kinds of biobanks, but then also uh, BioMe, University of Colorado, um, gr a growing number of uh, US biobanks, so many in the Emerge Network, um, Northwestern, uh, Wisconsin, um, Harvard partners, and so forth. So a, a lot of work in this area so at Vanderbilt, they built their electronic health records um, about 30 years ago. And so we have up to 30 years of electronic health records data, but on average, 10 to 15 years of electronic health records for subjects in whom we have DNA. In addition to the genome variation that we have it now, right now in about 120,000, and that's mostly uh, cheap biobanking chips, but more and more exome and whole genome sequencing. Um, we've imputed transcriptomes and metabolomes um, into these data. So we're working to do that now in the full large sample. As Kari pointed out, it, it's, it's really not enough just to have the genome variation. You really want to have as much information as possible in the proteome space, um, in the methylome space, and until we can afford to do that in everybody, one of the ways that we can enhance the information that we do have is to use um, the heritable part of that information and impute it into the biobank data using the genome variation. Now, the part of the, the biobank in the, that we have DNA on is really just the smallest part of the information on electronic health records that we have in 2.8 million additional subjects. And I, I really think one of the opportunities before us now is to aggregate all of the data in at least a federated way, because iterating between what we can do in genetics and what we can do in the pure phenomics in millions more individuals more immediately is fantastic, and the, while these are not the quality of epidemiological cohorts by any means, they are the only data we will ever have to do the transition from mechanisms to medicine in. We won't have research quality data for that transition. Learning how our genetics works at the phenomics level, the kinds of correlations that are created by pleiotropy in millions more subjects than we yet have the DNA on is a fantastic additional opportunity that we have if we can bring the data together. And that is a key point of sort of 
My career in genetics is trying to get people to bring the data together. And I continue to believe that it is going to be absolutely key to, to infusing this virtuous cycle of discovery to mechanism to medicine, because the more value we bring to the medicine part, the faster we will accumulate additional data to build that discovery into. Some of the, the newer methods that are being used um, in our biobank to really um, fuse the genetics to the larger scale data include something like a phenotype risk score, very analogous to genetic risk scores, but using only phenomic information. The first applications of the phenome risk scores were in the context of trying to understand how we might identify patients with Mendelian diseases that had not yet been diagnosed, um, and it's showing um, good possibilities in that direction. But I think the opportunities then to use these same kinds of things to better understand variants of unknown significance in large-scale data is another opportunity. So right now, the phenotype risk scores at Vanderbilt are being trans, we're undergoing translation to clinical use to really deploy these in the 2.8 million and look for patients with undiagnosed Mendelian disease, working out how to build the decision support to physicians that can suggest, have you considered this diagnosis? Here's how you would order the tests. We're creating new phenotype risk scores for example, for congenital anomaly clusters that have not yet been characterized as Mendelian disorders that we can build in 2.8 million subjects and then deploy in the subjects in whom we have genetic information to try to identify genetic factors that may drive some of the, the, the known clusters of congenital anomalies. But we're also trying to use more information on pleiotropy to create larger targets for discovery. Um, again, this is some, a way that we can go from the genetic information discovered with respect to pleiotropy back to very large numbers of individuals in whom we have phenome data to understand how predictive is this phenome for later development of disease, for example. We've also created some portals for um, putting out results of studies, so that's another thing that, that I've always been passionate about. It's great to provide the data, but about 10 million more times people query results portals um, than download the original data and redo all of the analyses. So we've been building predictive models using GTEx, um, in which we uh, look at the genetically regulated part of gene expression, apply those predictive models to BioView, um, use the EHR data, but not the hundreds of thousands of billing codes, but rather a much smaller number of fee codes to which that uh, large set of billing codes can be mapped, and create basically a gene by medical phenome catalog where instead of just thinking about what genetic variants are associated to asthma or rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes, you could really look at each gene and the medical phenome associated to it, a way to capture new kinds of annotations for genes that reflect medical phenome. And so this predict view portal um, will soon go public, so coming to soon to a computer at your desk. But again, the opportunity to, to do this on a much larger scale, to aggregate not just GWAS signals, but where we have it, measured expression, where we don't, imputed expression across large numbers of biobanks to, to understand what does each gene do? What does the natural variation in gene expression associate with across the entire medical field? Phenome. And I think the, the concept of using pleiotropy to aid in discovery, create larger targets for discovery, is something that, 
that others are, are looking at in a variety of ways. So there's some lovely work in Mendelian randomization about how to aggregate pleiotropic phenome to have larger targets for Mendelian randomization studies. And one of the things I've always taught to my students, no gene exists simply to cause human disease. A gene, whether it's, it's rare coding mutations with large effects or more common regulatory variants, regulatory in some way, that, that may ultimately increase risk for something as late onset as Alzheimer's, is almost certainly leaving signals in the electronic health record all the way along that if we learn how to read those signals correctly, can provide us with much larger, tar larger targets for discovery research, but could really change how we think about things like clinical trials as well. And so the opportunity to use the discoveries we make in the genetic space to go into the much larger healthcare um, phenome data to do predictive modeling, but things that we can learn in just the phenome space on what phenotypes do predict later onset disease is something that then we can take back into and is this part of the pleiotropic consequence of some of the same genetic variation. Just to show you a, a, a bit of an example in this space, this is the medical phenome associated to the gene TREM2 um, in BioView at a very early stage in uh, generating the, the big genotype data. And you see the whole phenome here relates to osteomyelitis with, with the uh, exception of uh, cerebral laceration and contusion and hallucination. This phenotype is of particular interest because rare, there's a rare recessive disease called uh, Nasu Hakola disease, uh, more, more common in Japan and Finland than in the US. But it's a disease where in late, uh, the late teens and early 20s, people develop um, fractures, uh, bone infections, bone cysts, um, that's followed uh, 10 to 15 years later by really serious early onset uh, dementia, usually death by age 40 or so. Very rare disease, um, but the bone cysts accumulate a lot of um, fatty necrotic tissue that's a very uh, good medium for infection, um, and, and so osteomyelitis and, uh, is, is not uncommon. Mutations, rare mutations at TREM2 and common variants affecting expression have been associated to Alzheimer's and other dementias. The phenome associated to the reduced genetically determined expression of presenilin-1 is virtually the same. Osteomyelitis and fractures. Um, you'll notice the C. diff infection is to increased expression. That's um, the odds ratio per unit standard deviation greater than one. Reduced expression is less than one. And so you get um, essentially the same thing happening in osteoclasts with reduced expression of presenilin-1 as happens with TREM2, and you won't be surprised to learn, with other Alzheimer's genes. So the opportunity to then take this into the cell atlas and understand better the relationship between the development of osteoclast, dendritic cells, microglia, to use more of that information um, could be fantastic. In addition, in BioView, a diagnosis of osteomyelitis before age 60 um, leads to a six-fold increased risk in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's after age 70. And when we push it to the limit that we can with the number of years that we have, um, the odds ratio actually increases. So osteomyelitis before age 50 is even more predictive of later onset Alzheimer's, although the sample sizes are smaller. Um, in silico tests of polygenic risk scores, discovery of new biomarkers, especially for diseases where we have few biomarkers. Um, young faculty are working on all of these things. Using genetics to improve existing biomarkers is a space where if we can aggregate electronic health records, there are tremendous opportunities 
to improve healthcare and truly reduce costs. We have so much more diversity in populations in the US and Canada than we did when many of our um, thresholds for uh, biomarkers, uh, sort of the normal ranges for biomarkers were originally set, that it's clearly important and absolutely possible to use genetic information to improve um, biomarker understanding um, by using the genetic information on alleles that differ by frequency in, in histor by historical geographic ancestry. And many of the biomarkers were developed specifically, thinking of them as dynamic and about the disease process, when in fact they're highly heritable, many of them, and in some cases the genetics work right along with the dynamic part of the biomarker. But in other cases, we would have better biomarkers by conditioning out the genetic information. So again, those opportunities are there. In the large scale data, creating new VRS, testing biomarker relationships, using the pleiotropic phenome, and even conducting in silico drug trials with existing drugs before you have the expense of going out into real data is something that if we bring the data together, uh, we can absolutely do. Thanks very much. Um, so Mark Daly is going to come and speak to us now. We'll just get the slides up. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation to discuss. Um, I think my talk will be sort of the parallel to, or the analog, if you will, to Nancy's talk from the perspective of a you know, being representative of what is or could be done in a number of especially Nordic countries, but ma many countries in Europe with um, nationalized healthcare systems and collection of systematic registries on, on populations about healthcare and many other aspects of life. So um, one of the reasons that I'm now a Nordic resident is the opportunities that come from a remarkable collection of data that uh, you can describe as, as being uh, registry based in terms of comprehensive and lifelong medical data on population that's available for research, as well as registra registry data on all drug purchases and many, many other registries capturing other environmental and, and social aspects of life from birth until death. In Finland, we also have a unique isolated population genetics history that largely emerges from the very distinct isolation that comes from being one of the few places that speak a Finno-Ugric Uralic language origin. And um, there's also a deep historical investment in epidemiology, population genetics, and genetics in general, as well as a population and a government that has a high trust and confidence in science and the government to manage their healthcare data. These are, as you can appreciate, being from the US side, not opportunities that come nearly so easily. But I think um, we can use this, hopefully, as a, as a template or an example for how this type of research with these type of resources can be done responsibly. And of course, for this audience, I don't need to walk through what all of the opportunities for biomedical research that come from the potential of these for both therapeutics and personalized medicine. So why Finland? I think I've walked through some of the opportunities, but it's a unique combination of a legal infrastructure, a population investment, um, and the fact that, that it's one of the largest unique isolated populations um, that exist anywhere in the world. And 
in particular, that partnership between the population, the government, and the healthcare system creates a unique environment for the type of research that we're all compelled by um, moving into the future. And one important aspect and one really unique aspect of, of how Finland has advanced these studies is through a series of laws, and, and the most important of which was a biobank act passed in 2013, and just the existence of something called a national biobank law should, should give some of us pause. Um, but it facilitates and enables both historical samples and new collections to move into a national biobank framework in which individuals are consented to have a broad consent for all medical research, they can be recontacted, and specifics regarding how collaboration with industry and collaboration with global researchers is all included in this act. So this provides a very important framework into which when we now perform genetic studies and new collections in Finland, samples that are collected from new recruited individuals are immediately phenotyped with lifelong data from all of these national health care registries and beyond. And these registries have been collected in some cases for decades and decades. This aspect is, of course, not at all unique to Finland. All Nordic countries have the possibility of, of doing this and many others as well, but it creates a framework in which we can walk back in time, in some cases more than 50 years, and have a very comprehensive view of an individual's life trajectory. And as our colleagues in Denmark, Søren and others have shown, there's great value in thinking about moving our epidemiology research and now perhaps our genetic research into thinking about things on not only a case control cross-sectional basis, but really on the lifelong evolution of disease. And so the FinGen project was launched, Arno who is here is the, is the head of the project, um, as a real, true, and functional pr public-private partnership in which the support for the project comes from both the Finnish government's innovation fund, Business Finland, as well as a pre-competitive consortium of nine pharmaceutical companies. And it's, of course, powered by, as I described, this National Biobank Act, and, and it describes how the, the thing can take place. Um, and importantly, security, of course, on individuals' medical data from birth to death is, of course, a highly sensitive thing. And there is a carefully developed and audited system for secure cloud access, wherein individuals from around the world can participate in the analysis of this activity if they are you know, approved to gain access to it. But the data cannot move from the one secure cloud location, which is in Finland or perhaps somewhere in the EU anyway. <coughs> the current progress in the project, which is only a small part of what I'm here to describe, is as it is with many of these biobank projects, it's rapidly evolving. We've gone quickly from the launch of the project two years ago to now having 180,000 individuals fully genotyped and registry phenotyped, and the collections are moving at a rapid pace such that this number will ascend to 500,000 over the next couple of years relatively swiftly. So what do we do with this? Well, we've got a great analytic team, Mitya and Yuha, who you can tell from their names, are Finnish by descent. I mean, you cannot tell from their names. They both actually live in, in Boston now and work with us at, 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 in the half of our groups that are at the Broad Institute. You run a scan, for example, of IBD, Standard GWAS, you get a lot of things that have been seen before, of course, because IBD has been very, very well studied in contrast to many, many other common and, and rare diseases. Um, but in fact, also turn up a novel association, which I first sort of told Yuha he had to go and figure out what the bug was in this and then fix it. And then after a few days, determined that it wasn't in fact a bug. And, and, and in fact, it was a novel but very consistent inflammatory signal that also has strong associations to uveitis, ankylosing spondylitis, and a variety of other phenotypes. And with Yuha, Mitya, and working with Masa and others building fine mapping tools, we can pin down the variant to something which we have no idea what it does at this point because we haven't yet evolved in this project to have all of the, the nice follow-on data that Kauri described, but hopefully we'll, in a year or so, have some better functional understanding of what goes on here. But the question really, of course, in something like IBD, where we've published with consortium activities over the past decade, 30,000 plus sample studies, is how could we possibly have missed something that's stronger than NOD2 and IL-23R? And the obvious observation is that, of course, this is a variant which is pretty much unique to um, Finland, also seen also in Estonia, where the, the, um, uh, the 
Uralic language um, origin is, is somewhat common, um, but could not have been observed unless someone had done a reasonably sized study of IBD genetics in one of these populations, which hadn't actually taken place yet. So that reminds us and brings us back to, of course, the origin, the other origin of the study, which was that we think there are specific advantages in discovery, especially in the types of low frequency coding variants that Kari was describing, in using isolated populations. Um, and we've known this for decades, that, that the Finnish population is full of quite bizarre and unique recessive diseases that are quite severe, that are seen very rarely anywhere else in the world, and that, that the origin of that is a population bottleneck that stochastically takes a handful of extremely rare variants from the rest of the world and boosts them several orders of magnitude in frequency. We've come in recent years to appreciate that such variants also have significant impact on common disease in heterozygous form and homozygous form. So this now becomes an interesting question, is how often would we find such variants? And so Konrad Karczewski, who's been um, leading the effort in analyzing and processing the NOMAD resource over the last couple of years, has generated a profile in which we can see basically the relative rate at which you find a coding variant, in this case, in the Finnish population and in the main European population. And you can see by the main node of this graph here, the majority of coding variants are seen at roughly comparable frequency or within a factor of 10 of each other in Finns and non-Finnish Europeans. But there's actually quite a substantial number of variants that are over here, which have anyway from a 10 to 1,000 fold excess in the Finnish population versus the rest of Finland. And when you take this apart by the numbers, you can see that by adding simply one additional somewhat isolated European population to the wealth of studies that have taken place in Europe, we're adding a very significant number of missense variants and other damaging and disruptive variants to what we have been able to significantly associate to disease using case control and, and family-based studies in Europeans over the last decade. And the majority of these, about 80%, are more than 10 times enriched in Finland, such that like the example I gave in IBD, we would have absolutely no chance to have seen them in the study so far. The point of this is not to emphasize the value of Finland. The point of this is to make us all think for a moment, if one isolated population that's clearly European in descent can provide this much novel content, then just imagine how much we absolutely must be missing by not taking advantage of the huge wealth of diverse and other isolated populations around the world. And this really needs to be one focus that we take forward if we are thinking of a global effort in human genetics of any kind. Um, we can do the same thing in type 2 diabetes, really any common disease, many associations, most of them well known. The ones here with stars are ones that map onto, again, significant associations that are to variants that are low frequency in Finland and extremely rare elsewhere. One of these was as a positive control of sorts here, published last year from Finnish sequencing studies that, that I didn't have anything to do with, but it was a very con compelling um, finding of a coding variant in AKT2 that significantly increased risk to type 2 diabetes and has that same allelic profile being essentially almost invisible in Northern and Western Europe, as you can see. So the other thing is uh, that that should convince that, okay, there's a lot more to come in discovery and potential generation of new therapeutic hypotheses. And I think Kari has made this point, Nancy has made the point, clearly our job is not done in the discovery sense. We also now start to think about whether prediction could have potential public health impact. Now, an interesting wrinkle on the examination of polygenic risk scores that you have in more isolated populations is that straight off of your array-based studies and your imputation, but these actually are directly genotyped as well as imputed um, highly accurately, you can see variants that actually would be the type of variants that are customarily screened for and, and clinically reported in breast cancer screening um, um, panels. Um, in the case of, of Finland, two of these that were boosted extremely significantly through the bottleneck were frame shifts in 
PALB2 and CHECK2, and these have obviously an outsized effect even in the first genome-wide association studies straight off the presses. So Samali, who's also here, and, and Nina Postdoc and his group have been examining um, these rare variants, or these low-frequency variants. They're still common. They're quite common in Finland as the the HNF1 alpha that, that Matt mentioned before, I consider a common variant in, but it, you know, restricted to um, the admixed populations in the United States and North America and South America. Um, what they've been examining is risk over age. And so the nice opportunity that you have with these Finnish resources is that many of these epidemiologic cohorts that are part of the study now, such as FinRisk and the Finnish twin study and so forth, were collected 20 and 30 years ago as healthy recruits. And so what they've seen is now an ability to essentially rewind the clock and look at actual incident cases. And so here you can see the risk to PALB2. When you layer on the polygenic risk score, you see an attenuation upward, obviously, if you're in the top decile of polygenic risk score. But what you see also is you see a very substantial reduction of risk when you identify individuals who carry the PALB2 mutation but have, are in the lowest decile of polygenic risk score. Same story with CHECK2. Polygenic risk score attenuates the risk upward and also downward, such that you carry the CHECK2 but a low polygenic risk score, you're actually at below average risk. So this really needs to be considered much more holistically than it's often discussed in the literature in terms of polygenic risk scores and rare variants being two separate entities that we don't know how to put together. We can figure this out, but only as a global community where the numbers and the scale of these studies can be built up. And there's a huge number of other new possibilities we haven't even begun to tap into. So the expanded phenotypic data that we have in these types of resources allow us to examine in these individuals hundreds of medical events through their lifetime. So we can really now think much more about longitudinal phenotypes. Wei, who's uh, working in, with Ben and myself and others, has been testing out novel approaches to make computationally feasible survival scanning, such that we can perform GWAS studies not on the incidence of disease, but on the time to a complication, or the time to death, or the time to a medical procedure after the diagnosis of disease. These start to turn up hits that are not related to the onset of disease association. And then we can look, obviously, importantly, at the use of today's most common drugs with respect to who responds well, who responds adversely, who does not have a helpful clinical response. Maybe we'll start to turn things up that help us in the future. These are complicated questions, and obviously the full ability to make use of this data in prediction is far beyond anything that I'm capable of doing. When you think about the enormous amount of data that you have from the genome, and then the time and enormous number of health events that one has, these will need to be really built out in the future. But I think we need to, for all of that last set of questions, we have no gold standard results. We can't possibly think that any one country, no matter how well it's organized, can answer this complexity of question. And we need to, if we are going to, as we're going to discuss the rest of this meeting, move from genetic mapping to mechanism and medicine, this must have a foundation of truly unimpeachable, durable genetic findings that are not going to go anywhere. And that demands, given the complexity, a global approach to discovery, interpretation, and dissemination. And I leave you with, with that as a thought. Um, you know, one example, we've all lived through sort of the candidate gene era years and years ago. I think we need to pay even closer attention to some of those old lessons because with the diversity of data that we have, the enormous number of phenotypes and different ways of approaching analytics in this data, we have a great challenge at our hand. So a lot was made out of this publication, which came out a few months ago, showing that Delta 32 homozygotes in the UK Biobank apparently had an increased rate of death by age 76. As you can imagine, some of us were not overwhelmed by the evidence of a one-tailed, for some reason, p-value of 0 0.009 given all of those possible phenotypes and tests that could have been run on these types of data. And indeed, both 
Kauri and his colleagues at Decode and our colleagues in Finland had the same thought later that week that we really should take a look at this a little more closely in our data sets. And in fact, in both of these data sets, the hazard ratio using a proper proportional hazards regression shows that apparently in these data, delta 32 homozygotes are actually slightly protected from premature death. So this just to say, we need to take global approaches to defining what are durable associations before we move into mechanisms, medicine, anything like that. Ben will continue this thread with global biobank activities, and thanks for your attention. Great, so thank you so much. Um, lots of food for further discussion. Um, so um, Rory Collins is going to um, take the next um, next talk. So we'll just load the slides. Thanks very much. Do you have um, 20 minutes? Do you want a two-minute heads up? Yes, you okay, okay. Um? Would you like a two-minute? Sure. Thank okay. you very much. I probably should have entitled this talk, um, uh, How Could um, We Have Done UK Biobank Better uh, If We Were To Do It Again? Um, and I think the answer would be to do everything in, in everyone. Um, earlier, someone said, you know, how we should do power calculations to determine how big a study should be. But I mean, I've never seen a study that's too big um, <laughs> myself. When I've been asked, you know, why were there half a million people in UK Biobank, I said there wasn't enough money for a million. So uh, um, what I would like to do is kind of reinforce the points that have been made about establishing some large prospective cohorts with biological samples in many different settings and the reasons for, for doing that. Obviously, um, one can study a wider range of exposures with respect to things like adiposity or LDL cholesterol. Um, you know, people in the US or Europe do not have normal LDL cholesterol, they have abnormal LDL cholesterol. If we want to know about normal, we go to populations with very much different diets from us and very much lower LDL cholesterol to find out what's normal, what's humanly normal. And our view of studying a particular population is a little bit like comparing people who smoke 10 cigarettes a day with 20 cigarettes a day and saying that's the effect of smoking, whereas zero is, is normal in that respect. The Obviously, there are diseases that are rare in one population and common in another. So if you want to study a particular disease, go where it's common, um, rather than try to study small numbers in your own population. And, and the kind of area that has been touched on earlier, the genetic heterogeneity between populations uh, can be very uh, helpful in trying to understand health-related variants. And also uh, trying to, to understand uh, non genetic associations better. And an example I wanted to give from, from uh, China around uh, alcohol and the belief, which I'm afraid is not true, that small amounts of alcohol uh, might be protective, which has been um, a conclusion that has come out over a long period of time from classical observational epidemiological studies. Um, people like Richard Dole used to religiously have a drink every night uh, because of his belief in that. But one can use the, um, uh, the genetic data to try to understand this better. Uh, so you know, we know how alcohol is metabolized, and we know that there, is different, um, there are different variants in different populations. Uh, and in particular, if we go to Eastern populations, Asian populations, uh, there are variants that accelerate the um, a metabolism of alcohol to acetaldehyde, and also variants that uh, uh, prevent acetaldehyde being uh, turned into acetate, so that we increase the um, uh, levels of acetaldehyde in those individuals. And you, you can tell very easily, actually, without doing any genetics, uh, which Asian individuals have these variants by just getting them to drink um, a glass of alcohol, and they will flush uh, very rapidly. And that flushing is unpleasant, and it actually stops people uh, uh, from drinking. So in the China Kudori Biobank, where they had 
uh, um, have done uh, genotyping on about 100,000 people um, out of the half million people that were in that cohort. A study that was set up actually before UK Biobank and from which we learned uh, a lot about how to do uh, the UK Biobank. Um, there are these two variants that are very strongly associated with alcohol intake among the men. I'm saying among the men because um, irrespective of genotype, as you'll see, the women in China tend not to drink alcohol at all. There are also very different um, alcohol consumption rates in different parts of uh, China. And the China Kadori Biobank recruited in five rural and five, rur uh, five urban areas. Uh, and you can see here the mean alcohol intake in men according to the nine possible combinations of those uh, genetic variants uh, in the different populations. So we had to stratify by population to look at alcohol intake uh, within, within each region uh, by their genetic variant. But you can see that the people who are uh, homozygote uh, for the two variants that actually increase the risk of flushing uh, have very low uh, rates of consumption. So you can predict stratifying by area mean intake um, of alcohol, uh, and you can see that the women produce a very nice uh, negative control so that one can uh, assess pleiotropic effects uh, and look at mean alcohol intake predicted by genotype, and then use that to determine whether uh, there is really a causal association. So if we look at the classic uh, Observational epidemiology, uh, again, we see exactly uh, what has been seen multiple times, that people who drink small amounts of alcohol appear to have lower risks of stroke, um, both ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, than those who drink uh, no alcohol at all. And of course, the concern has been, is this around some kind of reverse causality uh, uh, that is producing that association? It's been very difficult to un unpick that. Whereas when we look in the genetic epidemiology, we see this beautiful uh, log linear association whereby there is no protective effect on stroke. It would be fantastic to be able to look at this in coronary artery disease as well within the population. Coronary artery disease in Chinese is much uh, less common than stroke. Um, and because only 100,000 of the 500,000 have been genotyped, uh, there aren't enough individuals to do that. And one point I want to make is that despite all the fine words about the importance of genotyping those populations, uh, cohorts that exist in other, in other parts of the world, it is incredibly difficult to get funding from North American and European funders to fund the, the genotyping there. Uh, and so I think we really do need um, a, a different emphasis on, on doing that. And again, as we saw uh, in Mark's presentation, the, uh, the opportunity to have different um, uh, cohorts that we can go to allow us to do, uh, to do replication studies or to, c to refute uh, analyses and to do combined analyses in order to have uh, many millions of individuals. And just one point I think which is important is that, that we should take a advantage of the heterogeneity within and across populations rather than seeing it as some kind of disadvantage and its heterogeneity is our friend uh, rather than representativeness. So what are the kinds of things that if I was going to get the opportunity again to do UK Biobank that I would, would like to do? Well the first thing is asking as many questions and linking to as many kind of records that one can that characterize the individuals and measuring as many things as possible in all of the participants at the time of recruitment into the cohort. Um, you, you will never regret uh, having got more information about uh, the ca characterizing exposures. The problem, of course, is how do you characterize not present but past exposure? The, 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 the easy thing about smoking has been that you could ask people how much they smoked at different times in their life. But how do you ask them how much exposure have they had to pollution when they were 5, 10, 15, 20? So try you, and a lot of the focus on monitoring and trying to assess things is about assessing exposure now. 
environmental monitors to ex uh, around exposure now. But in places, say, like China, uh, exposure in the past, particularly smoke within the home, is likely to be far more important than the exposure ev that, there are, that people are being um, presented to uh, at the present time because of, say, cooking. Much deeper phenotyping in all of the individuals around imaging. We're imaging 100,000 in UK Biobank. When we came up with the idea of imaging 100,000, we wrote to all the imaging experts and said, we'd like to image 100,000. They said, very important to do imaging. But you did mean 10,000, didn't you? And we said, no, no. We really need to, to characterize very large numbers of individuals because only a small proportion of them will develop any particular condition. And we only came up with 100,000 because it was about 10 times bigger than anybody had thought. But really, it should have been all of them. And to do it repeatedly would be even more valuable. Around remote monitoring, we measure blood pressure once. But what about the variability in blood pressure? Uh, uh, Carrie talked about um, atrial fibrillation, but we know that most atrial fibrillation is actually not picked up. So how do we uh, detect um, parax uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and understand um, uh, the associations with genetic and other uh, risk factors? Can we do repeated assessments over time to, to, to help with that? Collecting as much biological sample, even if you think it's implausible that you'll be able to analyze cells or tissue uh, at scale, collect it because probably in the future you will be able to. Um, you, we just in the last couple of weeks uh, were given funding to uh, sequence the whole of UK Biobank. I don't think that 10 or 15 years ago, when the study was set up, anyone had envisaged that it, we, we would be at that point now. Um, and the question is you know, not uh, can we do it, but that we would need to work out how to make it feasible to do these things at scale. And if you don't collect the sample, you can't assay the sample, obviously. So we need to collect blood, urine, stool, cells in hundreds of thousands of people, even if we don't think uh, it's going to be possible to analyze them, and in lots of different ways. The other thing that I've tried to argue with UK Biobank is do what you have to do now, but in the main, defer. So one of the first things I did when I uh, was asked to take on UK Biobank was to cancel the order for auto-analyzers and, and, and not do any assays on the samples, and just to wait until it became cheaper to do much more informed analyses. So rather than genotyping samples as they come in or doing biomarkers on samples when they come in, then defer. And probably the daftest thing that we did do was spend about 10 million pounds, which is probably about $10 million the way you know, our, our currency is going um, by now, <laughs> but, but spending 10 million pounds doing a huge amount of work, measuring about 30 or 40 biomarkers, lipids and things, in all half million people. I mean, it, it would have been like doing candidate genes, you know, 40 candidate genes in all half million. Um, it really was not a very smart thing to do. Um, and so the best thing to do is just collect all the different samples, store them, and then wait. And wait until you can do it on everybody. The problem is that if you set up these cohorts, people say, um, you will, you need to, you have some early wins. To which the answer is no. You, when we had the renewal for UK Biobank about three years ago, I was asked what had UK Biobank done that it was set up to do? And I said nothing. Um, and that wasn't really the answer that I was meant to give, but it was the true answer. You, what, it's only now that a prospective cohort becomes of value. So, Doing nothing is actually the most important thing to do until it's the right time to do it, and then to do it really at scale. So nested case control studies, using up your sample, your valuable sample on nested case control studies so that you can get a publication and so you can say to the funders, look, aren't we good? We've been productive, is a bad idea. By contrast, waiting until you've got all the samples, then pulling the samples out in a random order so that you know that there must be no real shift in the values as you go through, 
so that you actually can use the cohort as an internal quality control is a, is, is a much smarter way of doing things. Also, if you go and ask people for the, to, to analyze half a million rather than 5,000, you get a very good deal. So it's far more cost effective you can minimize the depletion of your valuable sample. You can improve your quality control, as I say, by using the cohort as an internal <laughs> control. And it supports lots of different comparisons. If you do a nested case control study here in, say, coronary disease, and a nested case control study here in, say, stroke, then the assay methodology will be different. So you can't really combine across those different case controls. And of course, if you generate data, unlike samples, it's readily shareable. So it's a very cost-effective strategy in the long term, particularly if you're trying to build resources for many different researchers to use. And the example of UK Biobank, you know, the, of the, the ability to take all the genotyping data, which was done at scale on all half a million people, at a fantastically low price, uh, because we were going out and saying, how cheaply can you do this? Um, allows you to use the genetic data to look at, say, breast cancer, but also at prostate cancer, also at type 2 diabetes, coronary disease, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you, the, the value is, is enormous. But the other kind of point I want to make, and really to reinforce the point that, that Carrie was making, is that um, as an epidemiologist, my only interest in genetics is it helps to fund good quality epidemiology. Um, and that you, we need to be thinking beyond the genetic uh, data. And so you, know, you could do the same thing with proteomics as you can do with genomics, that one can look at how that can be used to improve predictive inference about particular conditions. And this is one example from using somologic data uh, showing over and above all the other kind of known uh, risk factors that you can um, uh, use proteomic data to improve predictive inference. And as I think Carrie has pointed out, you could also use it uh, importantly to understand the link, which is the key uh, aim of this project here, the link between the genes and disease. What other kinds of assays should we be doing in the cohorts that we have to try to understand that link? And so you know, we've started to, to think about, well, how would you do what we've done with genotyping in UK Biobank uh, and do with respect to uh, other kinds of omic assays? And this is one example from uh, work that Tony Wetton uh, and Bernard Keaveney in Manchester, along with uh, guidance from experts across the world, thinking about how one could generate um, uh, MS data on proteomics that would, uh, at scale, across all half million people, um, where you could generate this kind of information. And I think that uh, in the same way that, uh, as um, uh, Eric pointed out, you know, the, 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 whole, the, the genome area has really pushed, you pushed the price of doing things down enormously. Can we do the same thing in other omic areas? Beyond phenotyping the participants, one of the weakest aspects of prospective cohorts is the phenotyping of the health outcomes. So how do you get really detailed information about the, uh, and characterize the health outcomes in great detail? Does that matter? Well, yes, absolutely. So if we take things like breast cancer, if you look at something very simple like reproductive factors, then reproductive uh, measures such as parity or age at menarche or age at first birth are very strongly associated with particular types of breast cancer. Breast cancer with hormone receptors on have quite different associations with those without. So if you didn't know that, if you didn't know whether or not those the breast cancers had or didn't have those markers, you would get an average effect. You would miss that specificity. And the same will be true around um, all kinds of uh, specific analyses. So how do we, at very large scale, 
get really specific information about the disease outcomes in the participants, particularly when we're trying to get that through linkage to health records. So how do we de develop approaches to health records to improve the quality of uh, the, and the specificity of our characterizations? And one of the things I think we need to be thinking about is uh, can we use other kinds of assays? And this is another kind of proteomic example of uh, using proteome to not characterize the participants, but characterize uh, the, the disease um, and, and disease, uh, in this case, the asthma uh, derived from sputum proteomic signatures, that one can see different kinds of asthma that may then be associated with different kinds of predictive um, markers. So in conclusion, from my perspective of you, what do we really need to do uh, in terms of prospective cohorts is establish several in different settings and support them in the way that we've been so fortunate to have them supported in UK Biobank by the Wellcome Trust and the MRC. To have much more detailed characterizations of those participants uh, with imaging, remote monitoring, all sorts of other things, and cohort-wide assays, not just of genetics, but of many other markers and to collect and, and store many different kinds of, of uh, sample. To establish ways of following up those health outcomes in those individuals, and that's particularly challenging in some of the populations in India, Africa, South America that we may want to study. And to, as I mentioned, develop scalable outcome phenotyping strategies uh, for those uh, data. And then finally, when we create this enormous amount of data, and this is certainly an area that we in UK Biobank are looking to the help of the community here, is how do we do, um, put this very large scale, very complex data onto platforms that allow uh, researchers to analyze them and to actually visualize the data. And in the same way that we talk about having access to data in different populations, how do we actually ensure accessibility of data from researchers in those different populations? When we look at UK Biobank, there are lots of UK researchers, lots of North American researchers, lots of European researchers, but only 40 or so from Russia, very few from Africa, from India, even from China. So not only should we be thinking about going to other populations to access their data, but we should be thinking about how we ensure that the scientists in those populations can access the data as well. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So our next um, speaker is the last speaker in this session, um, which has been Neil. Um, and um, then afterwards we'll have a discussion session. So at the end of this talk, can I ask everyone who's spoken in this session to join us um, up, up here, uh, and we can have um, an, an animated discussion before lunch. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers uh, for the opportunity to speak to you about um, cohorts and, and how they're really transforming our understanding of human common disease. Uh, the session so far has been tremendous, and I'll try and describe some of our efforts on UK Biobank and then go a little bit deeper into the value of diversity and the value of really trying to work together in, in some of the ways that, that Mark articulated. Uh, I also want to echo Kari's comment that the UK Biobank is the most noble experiment in uh, biology I think ever accomplished. The data sharing model is tremendous and we've had the opportunity to work with this data pretty deeply over the course of the last couple of years. And it really has been this sort of team science model where we have lots of different expertise coming together to really try and crack open uh, the genetic architecture of what is hoped to be, I suppose, every human disease that is out there in the big wide world. Now, 
In 2017, we released uh, results for primary association of every uh, kind of endpoint that was defined in UK Biobank. Uh, we didn't write a paper, rather we, in a sense, followed the UK Biobank's model and just released the summary statistics uh, globally for people to consume and use however they kind of deemed suitable and, and useful. And, and I think that that, you know, the technological changes that we're experiencing now with how straightforward it is to disseminate information is something that we as scientists should continue to adopt and push forward because uh, these results have tremendous value across a variety of different important scientific questions ranging from epidemiology, as Rory talked about, to biology like Kari talked about, to even how we think about the phenotypic definitions themselves. And, and I think genetics has a, a particularly powerful role to play in that landscape as it really gives us this sort of common basis by which to compare different phenotypes, by which to compare different ways of defining different traits, as well as comparing different analyses. It, it really acts as that sort of Rosetta Stone between what humans are doing and what the biological system is doing. So the, the kind of analysis that we did has now been subject to some additional updates. We've expanded the number of covariates we've included. We've run sex stratified analysis of every single endpoint. And we did all of these updates based on feedback from the community. So there were a bunch of people that said, why didn't you include age as a covariate? You know, can we include some of the additional covariates in the analysis? And I think that sort of organic life cycle of moving back and forth between what analyses we release and what analyses the community itself desires is something that I could see an ICDA really trying to take on as part of its mission, is to really provide the best possible results done in the way that respects the phenotype and answers the scientific questions that are most important to the people focused on those specific issues uh, at, at the time. So one of the things that we've looked at is a kind of systematic evaluation of common variant heritability. About four or five years ago, we wrote a paper on a method to estimate heritability simply from summary statistics and linkage disequilibrium information. And we systematically applied that across every trait that we've looked at in, in UK Biobank. Here's one snapshot of this. So we have two terms here on the x-axis is the intercept, which is a kind of indication of how much residual population stratification or technical bias or confounding there might exist in the, in the GWAS. And then on the y-axis is the, the heritability that we get estimated. And pretty much everything that has sufficient sample size in terms of number of cases or sufficient sample size in terms of a continuous measure shows some common genetic variant heritability. This is very much a feature of every complex trait out there under the sun. And so common variants really do matter. And so GWAS really matters and can help to teach us a variety of the different things that we've already uh, heard about. Similarly, we can start to look at genetic correlation. So this is a, a website that we haven't announced, so I suppose this is the first public announcement, but it's a browser for the genetic correlation between every pair of traits from UK Biobank, where we've estimated not only the heritability, but the degree of overlap. And just to give you an illustration of what this looks like, so you can take a look at the individual genetic correlation ranges that you're interested, or the p-value, you can threshold on that. Uh, you can also choose a, a, a phenotype and then look at all of the other traits that it correlates. So I, I chose miserableness, which is my personal favorite phenotype from UK Biobank. Are you ever miserable for no reason, for no apparent reason? That's the question. About 40% or so of participants respond yes, which I think tells you something about the UK that really <laughs> feels very right. And we see that miserableness, that phenotype, right? So just that question shows genetic correlation with a variety of perhaps more common ground things that we look at when we think about mental health. Things like neuroticism score or recent feelings of depression and those kinds of questions. And so even simple questions, if they're collected at scale, can actually start to really boost our understanding about a whole range of human diseases and, and outcomes. Now I just want to spend a little bit more time really focusing on this diversity question because there are a number of areas where diversity really matters. I'm going to talk about two. One is in locus discovery, the second will be in polygenic scores, uh, but it also relates to fine mapping. I, I think Hillary is going to talk about fine mapping tomorrow, uh, which is another critical aspect of really realizing the potential of these genetic discoveries. So the PGC has engaged in large-scale schizophrenia meta-analysis now for quite some time, probably 
close to about 10 years of PGC activities. Most of those efforts have been focused in European populations. Uh, we're now up to something like 67,000 cases and nearly 250 loci. And at the same time, we've pulled along this question of trying to do a deeper dive in East Asian populations. So this is an effort that Hailiang Huang, who's a faculty member in ATGU with Mark and myself and, and, and others, uh, has really spearheaded bringing together as many of the different Asian case control cohorts for schizophrenia. And we're up to about 13,000 that are included in analysis, and there are maybe another seven or 8,000 that are kind of hanging out there in the community. And I just want to comment that we can find new loci by examining different populations in exactly the same way that Mark was talking about those finished and rich variants. So here's, a, here's an association uh, locus zoom plot. Uh, down here you see in this table that's got some really interesting uh, kind of artifact from the, the projector there. Uh, this is a variant that is 5 times 10 to the minus 11 in the East Asian GWAS of schizophrenia. Uh, super apparent, you know, plenty significant. Uh, and it's got a frequency of about 45%. And then when you look at the European meta-analysis, this variant has a frequency of less than 1%. And this is just one example of what is going to be a very pervasive phenomenon when we think about exploring lots of other different populations. Uh, this gives us new windows into disease biology that we will miss if we only focus on, say, Europeans. And so diversity really is a, a critical aspect for getting as comprehensive a picture of the biological basis of human disease as we can possibly achieve. And so really this global effort is an important aspect of how we think about carrying genetics forward. Second to that, let's talk a little bit more about polygenic scores. Uh, Matt highlighted polygenic scores, but just to give you a little refresher, all we're doing here is taking estimates of SNP effects, summing them times the genotype that individuals have to create a composite predictor. And that predictor can go a lot fancier than that, but at its core, this is the, the central idea. Uh, as Amit Kara and Saik have demonstrated quite clearly, this works across a variety of endpoints, and we're able to identify individuals at substantially elevated risk, but also substantially diminished risk. Integrating rare and common variants, as Mark talked about, will be an important direction. But what I want to spend a moment on is, is diversity. And so this is really drawn from a, a recent paper that Alicia Martin uh, led, demonstrating that the composition of most genetic studies are still largely European. We do not have much in the way of diversity in terms of our genetic studies. And that has a really serious impact on the performance of polygenic scores across these different ancestral populations. And so everything here is tagged to what's going on. Do I have this? Oh, I do have this. That's better. So what's tagged up here is the predictive value of a variety of different traits. They're all listed below, uh, looking at the, the predictive power of a polygenic score in European populations. And then as we drift across other ancestries and, and look at American or South Asian, East Asian or African populations, we see a pretty consistent reduction in the PRS R squared. There's a reduction in the predictive uh, ability of these kinds of uh, composite scores to really translate into the meaningful prediction that is going to help uh, identify at-risk individuals in a healthcare setting. And so diversity is not simply about trying to do locus discovery. Diversity is also about ensuring that the benefits of polygenic scoring are felt uniformly across the entire population, not just simply in Europeans. Similarly, we've replicated this looking at some asthma GWAS where, again, having samples from the population in question really makes a dramatic difference in terms of the quality of the polygenic prediction. And I think this is an area where there needs to not only be new data, but also new methods and, and new opportunities for exploring how we construct these to balance across the question of, of managing ancestry in, in polygenic scores. So to close, I'm just going to comment on some of the thoughts about where we might go from here. Like, what are some of the opportunities that are out there in the big wide world? And the first and perhaps most important one is this nascent biobank meta-analysis initiative. So Mark, along with Kristen Willer and myself, and many others across the community, have come together to try and start to systematically integrate results from biobanks. Thank you for everyone in the room who submitted summary uh, statistics. We really appreciate it. Super important. 
but here's a, a snapshot of what biobanks are available now with genotype sample that have expressed interest in joining this kind of uh, effort. And, and we're up to a sample size of about 2 million individuals. And we can take phenotypes that are pretty straightforward to capture in a healthcare setting, things like asthma, and ask questions about what the individual GWAS is from each of the individual cohorts. So, you know, the UK biobanks, definitely the sort of, uh, you know, 500 pound gorilla in the room when it comes to biobanks, but others are sort of catching up, looking at, at FinGen and, and, and those kinds of cohorts. But when we integrate, we go from a handful of loci to 76 loci. Now, for the geneticists in the room, this is fully expected, right? Meta-analysis, it works, it delivers more loci, it improves the resolution of the SNPs that we're finding, uh, and it really boosts power. But we have the opportunity not only to do this for asthma, but we can also think about doing it for things like primary open angle glaucoma. Uh, I have like a ton of other slides that are in here, but in the interest of time, I'll just focus here. So with glaucoma, we're up to 25 loci. But uh, engine for discovering loci for every single human disease that's captured in a healthcare setting and systematically evaluated seems to be a possibility. And that's a possibility that I think we should carry forward in an effort to really improve our understanding of the biology of human disease, the epidemiology of human disease, and push into that clinical translation space. Now I'll skip through looking at the, well, last, last data slide. So here's a, a description of the sort of asthma association results from biobanks with the asthma association results from the latest meta-analysis or one of the latest meta-analysis published. And we see that all of the SNPs are moving in the same direction, but we see a substantial gap in the kind of effect size between these two different cohorts. And so I think there's uh, questions around how we integrate, define, and curate phenotypes and how we can use genetics to improve our interpretation of those things is a particularly uh, promising opportunity. And so that I'll conclude, I'll put the slides up there that you can and just see. And I just wanna say thanks to the organizers again, my other speakers in this session, and with that, I'll close. Can I just stay here, something like that? So we're gonna invite everyone. Yeah. yeah, so thank you so much, and thank you for making up a minute or two for us as well. So thank you, we'll um, bring everyone up, and then if I can ask people who want to ask questions or start discussion to step up to the mic, and I will try and be fair in my distribution of mic uh, questions. So if you have your question or your point of discussion for a specific uh, member of our um, group, please just um, indicate that as well. Thank you. Do you want to start here? Uh, Ju Judy Cho, Mount Sinai, New York. I have a question for Nancy and a question for Kari. So the question for, for Nancy um, is genes don't exist to cause disease. Uh, a brilliant point. And so thinking about potential action items and foundational resources, uh, we haven't talked much about evolutionary selection and there's a lot of empiric data. You know, APOL1 and trypanosoma mycobacterial disease and Crohn's disease. Um, so kind of think about that. And then for Kari, the question is, the FLT3 ligand and uh, receptor, you know, source target mappings are terribly important. Um, and in the mechanisms to medicines uh, working group, we talked about directionality, but magnitude of effect. And do you just think it's, use, it's hopeless? You, you kind of said it's not gonna work because of the leukemia lymphoma thing. Uh, but in auto and synthroid works. So those are my two questions. So, so what, with respect to the, the no gene exists to cause disease, you're really asking what, what more we need um, to, to get uh, a better understanding of the link to sort of the whole way along the phenome. I, I think Part of it is the mechanisms end and understanding the relationships among cells, the, the cell lineages and, and sort of their, their evolutionary history in the human body. We understand from GTEx how much of the genetic architecture can be shared across tissues in, for genes that are expressed in those tissues. To some extent, there will be some shared architecture in cells of similar developmental lineages, and, and yet we understand also the importance of the context specificity. So I think um, marrying what we can learn 
at the large scale genetic discovery with much more work in many more cell types is just unequivocally something that we must have for the mechanisms, but also the mechanisms to medicine aspect of this. And, and again, learning more about the pleiotropic phenome that is gonna happen decades before the diseases that we know can be an outcome of some of these uh, variants. And I think Kari. there was a question for Kari too. Was there a question for me? I, I honestly didn't hear the question, but I, I, I was zoning out somehow. But, but when you talk about the, the pleiotropic phenome and what can be read out of it, one of the things that I am struggling with a little bit is that on the basis of about 12 proteins in the proteome, we can find we can find 5% of women from an unselected population between the ages of 65 and 75 who are at 60% probability of dying within the next five years. We can find 5% of women at the age between 65 and 75 who are at almost no probability of dying within the next five years. What do you do with that? All right. It's, it's, no, it's not, it's not a laughing matter, it's a very complicated matter. Because uh, if you take 5% of the American population, because my prediction is that, as usually, we Icelanders serve as a reasonably good animal model for the Americans. So, <laughs> and if you, if, you if you take 5% of your population, who are at this enormous risk of death within a reasonably short period of time, and you can intervene, what are you going to do? There, isn't, there aren't the financial resources to deal with that. So these are the things that we will have to face, and these are, these are awesome things to face. All right? 60% probability of dying within the next five years. I, I want to make it absolutely clear that I haven't the faintest idea what the concentration of these proteins are in my plasma. <laughs> all causes of death. Just all causes of death. All causes of death. Okay. Can we take another question, maybe from the back, Mike? We'll do a rotation around the mics if that's fine. Okay. Or comment, yeah. Uh, my name is Christian Wehm. I'm representing the Hunt Court and Hunt Biobank. And I would like to make just a few comments to. Um, to Rory Collins' uh, thought-provoking thought talk. I think it was very interesting, and I would like to add okay. to, um, to what you told the reviewers that uh, UK Bi Biobank had actually accomplished nothing in the first period. I think in, 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 the, in respect to what you have planned to do, but I think the, the fact that uh, your data-sharing policy has been a tremendous success. Uh, and probably the most attractive factor uh, with the um, UK Biobank um, is, uh, as you already pointed out, that researchers throughout the world can access your fantastic data. Uh, but I must say, for all of us striving um, to convert biology into data, um, it's interesting what you say that um, you have to wait for the right time when you should do the analysis. Uh, that depends on whether you're attractive enough for the funders uh, when you think that the right time has occurred. And uh, I think one interesting um, point there could be the fact that UK Biobank are now doing 500,000 whole genomes um, in, at the same time as you're doing 500,000 whole exomes. And um, when you uh, pointed at the Kanduri Biobank and the uh, uh, to do more analysis on other cohorts. Um, maybe we should, or if it was possible, to have a system where we could distribute funding more sort of globally uh, in, the, um, in, in the sense that maybe we can get more scientific results uh, at an earlier stage. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. <coughs> um, 
I mean, UK Biobank uh, is in the, probably the right sense of the word, um, suffering from an embarrassment of riches uh, in that respect. Um, what you have to understand, though, is as a resource, uh, it is available for um, researchers to come along and say that they will fund assays in UK Biobank. So, um, although the genotyping was a grant to UK Biobank to genotype all half a million people. And I think the time was right to do that. Um, it was actually a research application that came along and said we would like to do exome sequencing um, that was initiated by Regeneron and then a consortium of uh, companies uh, that decided that they wanted to do the exome sequencing. Um, and equally, it was a, another research application uh, in this case from government charity and industry that came along to UK Biobank and said um, we would like to do whole genome sequencing. So from our perspective, the only question we had was would it increase the amount of data in UK Biobank usefully um, at no cost, material cost to UK Biobank, uh, to which the answer was, well, it wasn't going to use up much sample, it was DNA, and, and it was going to generate a whole lot of data. The question of whether it was good value for money was not a question that we had to address. And if you had asked me, I would have said I would wait until whole genome sequencing is much cheaper, uh, and I would have put the money into other kinds of omic assays. But as it wasn't a question uh, for me, um, I didn't give that answer. Well, I, I did actually, but. <laughs> right, so we'll go here, and then there, and there, and there. Carl Anderson, uh, welcome to Sanger Institute. So that was a really great uh, session, and clearly all of the cohorts that were presented have done and will continue to make a really profound impact on medical research, but I didn't want to let the cohort session pass without, especially when there are so many funders in the room, without drawing attention to the need for phenotype and disease-specific cohorts and their particular utility. So Eric mentioned in his talk the huge number of samples that would be needed in population cohorts to get to appreciably large numbers of uh, disease patients. But also I think it's not just about the numbers, it's also about the phenotypes. So these population biobanks have got great broad phenotypes, but what they don't have is the deep phenotypes that you need when you're doing deep dives into specific diseases. They also don't often have access to perhaps disease relevant tissues, which disease phenotype cohorts often do as well. And so I want to make that point. And I suppose my question to the panel is how can we leverage expertise that's within population um, biobanks and cohorts and allow those of us who might have um, kind of feet in the camp of disease cohorts to leverage that expertise? I think it would be great if our um, UK IBD bio resource was somehow connected to the UK biobank and when you were reaching out and getting assays done on your samples, getting efficiencies and economies of scale, we could run those on our 50,000, 25,000 um, IBD patients and get the same assays done. And I think that would be a great outcome for um, ICDA. I'm interested in the thoughts on the panel on that. Mm -hmm. this, this sounds a little bit different when you're working like Mark and I in Scandinavia, yeah. it's a, it works in a, a little, little bit different yeah. way because Everybody. possibly in Iceland we have genotyped half of the population. Yes. We can impute fairly well into the other half of the population. Yeah. And so we basically, we have the disease. But you don't have enough Crohn's disease patients for me, Carrie. Pardon me? You don't have enough IBD patients for me in Iceland. Mm -hmm. We don't have, what did you say? Many uh, inflammatory bowel disease enough. patients in Iceland. What, what you be, mean by enough? We <laughs> feel that it is an accomplishment to have you of them. <laughs> <laughs> but there are, there, are, there are many different subphenotypes, and if you want to understand particular subphenotypes, which I, I won't I, name because we're close to lunchtime, um, then you need very large numbers of disease patients just doing deep dives into those specific phenotypes. I, act, actually, we have made contributions to the work on, on IBD in collaboration with Mark. And, um, and because, of the, because of the founder effect, we have been able to pull out some, some rare stuff in IBD. But of course, we are a relatively small population. Next to me sits a man who works in a bigger population of the, of the same nature. And, and he enjoys the same kind of benefits that into the fiend gene is a fo are folded, you know, 
the, the patient cohort. You, you live in America, it's a nation led by United Donald Trump, Trump. <laughs> and it's always, anyway, there you go. it's always difficult to live there. He's even worse off. So can I just, um, yeah. sorry, check in with our organizers. We're technically at the end of the session. May we run in five to ten minutes? Yes. Okay, great. So I know Rory also wanted to respond. Well, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with your point. I mean, if you like case control studies where you get a big collection of very well phenotyped cases are fantastically good for looking at genetic um, associations. But of course, the, the value of a prospective cohort is being able to look at genetic and non-genetic factors um, where disease may not have affected your, your non-genetic factors. But the weakness of it is, which is what I was highlighting, was the, poor, the relatively poor characterization of the disease cases. And so that's where I think we really need to do a lot more. Uh, because again, when you're thinking about building a resource, you're trying to build it for people who are interested in lots of different diseases. And how do you actually get deep phenotyping of tens of thousands of many different uh, diseases, and, and I think that's where we need the people who specialize in particular disease areas to work with the prospective cohorts to try to, to come up with, with um, scalable <coughs> approaches to, to doing that, that deep characterization of the health outcomes. Thank you. Great, thank you. So we've got yeah, a question Tom at the front. Thomas Lena, NIMH. My question is to all of you. Uh, many of you mentioned in your remarks the, the use of intermediary molecular phenotypes like gene expression, methylation, proteomics to either understand disease states or to uh, develop uh, precision medicine paradigms. Since the, not all organs are assayable, like the brain, easily assayable, how, you, how useful are these uh, molecular intermediaries? And what are the kinds of experiments you would need to devise, such as a cheat text for uh, disease states, or how, how can we find out how, how good the periphery, which is easily accessible, is a good proxy for bi biological processes and, dis and or disease states and or prediction uh, in other organs? We have, to make it a, we have to make it a point of emphasis to do studies on the brain, even though they're more difficult. And only then can we assess the answer to that question. And, and actually, when you, when you begin to phenotype for the brain, when you, when you want to use genetics to develop understanding of the brain, one, one of the things that you have to do is to extend the studies beyond the surrogates for what it is that you want to look at. And, and one of the things that Mark and I can do, basically, is that we, in addition to looking at specific tests for cognitive function, educational attainment, we can basically look at the fate of people in life in general, which in, ma in many ways is dictated by generates you the final common vector of what happens in a person's brain over a lifetime. But it's complicated. There, there, are, there are not just technological problems with the phenotyping of the brain, there are epistemological problems that are difficult to get over. For example, we don't have a definition of a thought. We don't have a def definition of an emotion. How are you gonna study things that affect phenomena that you cannot even define? So we have, we have theoretical limitations to what we can uh, get by using the technology. We may have theoretical limitations, but I think again, Learning more about different cells can help us a lot. So beautiful work on a particular type of cell that expresses the CFTR gene in the lung, a very small minority of lung cells um, that, that express CFTR uh, and as a major driver of then the cystic fibrosis phenotype. But of course, because of the phenotypic manifestations that we already know of in other um, organs, there are cells in those other organs that express this same protein and when it's defective lead to phenotypic consequences in male gametogenesis in pancreatic tissue. And, um, and we know from GTEx that there is at least one cell in brain that also um, expresses this uh, gene and where you can build really high quality prediction models for CFTR 
um, in a number of these tissues um, that must have some cells with a similar lineage. And the more we can learn about cells like that expressed in the brain, in other tissues, um, and even if we can't always sample brain, we may be able to learn enough from cells from other tissues um, to, to, to make uh, uh, conclusions, to, to have proxies uh, that, that we can use. That's the research that needs to be done yet. So I would make a recommendation that the ICDA should actually make a recommendation along those lines because as a funder, this is a difficult area for us. I, 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 question, I question that we are going to learn an awful about, lot about the nature of thought by looking at the expression of CTFR in the choroid plexus. So in the interest of time, I'm sorry, I don't want to discuss any, uh, cut any discussions short, but we have three very patient waiters for questions. So I wonder if we could um, take those last three questions and, uh, or comments and just try and keep our responses fairly short so that everybody gets a chance at least to flag what they want to say. So we've got number one, number two, and then Charles at the front, number three. Okay, thank you, Mila Pakunina, NCI. Um, first of all, it's bloody cold here, especially when you're shivering by the mic for, for some time. Um, so it's amazing resources. Thank you very much to all of you uh, with all the amazing uh, cohorts, public or less public, hopefully shareable soon. Um, um, I'm primarily interested in cancer right now, and I would really like to see that we introduce cancer GWAS data uh, to be cross um, intersected with metabolic and immune phenotypes because they are all important for cancer and we are going to learn a lot about biology uh, across these um, different phenotypes. And I wonder what the panel thinks about it. And I also would like to mention that NCI started a prospective cohort of up to 200,000 people which will have information on different genetics, genomics, environmental factors, including occupational exposures and environmental exposures, and also preneoplastic and tumors collected from these patients for very deep analysis. Thank you. I think we're all quite interested in cancer and the role of the germline, and this has been you know, somewhat understudied in the past, and I know in Gowrie's study and in our study, we are very much focused on this and the longitudinal <coughs> aspects could actually teach us things, and I think in Nancy's yeah. as well, this would be the case. Yeah, no, long-term outcomes, it's also critical to understand for cancer patients, you know, who've received different kinds of therapies, and then the consequences for their lives downstream are also things that, that we can learn much more about with, with additional study. Okay, great. We'll move on to our second last question or Hi, comment. I'm Jose Flores from the Mass General and the Broad Institute in Boston. So we've heard the parameter need to continue expanding the sample sizes either through biobanks that are agnostic to phenotype or maybe disease-driven cohorts. And I was curious as to the panel's opinion on two difficulties that, that we encounter. So on the biobank side, it is relatively straightforward for a government perhaps or, or even a healthcare system to try to prove the return on investment on why it's important to genotype everybody that belongs to a particular country or in their healthcare system. I think for academic medical centers, particularly private ones in the United States, they are seeking a way to monetize the return on that investment. And that kind of erects barriers as to how you could share data and make it available to other people. So how do you convince the academic medical center administration or the investors that this is worth playing with the entire field so that it is not simply a commodity that you're selling to pharma companies or et cetera. So that's on the biobank side. On the cohort side, you try to build a cohort, and at least for traditional funding mechanisms, um, you have a very modular way that is hypothesis-driven to try to get it funded. And so it is increasingly difficult to make the argument that with the somewhat limited numbers you can do in that cohort, you're going to just make many discoveries. And so how do you convince funders that all of this is piecemeal, that all of the genetic discoveries that we've had have been because individual participants or individual cohorts were funded to do something, and it was only the meta-analysis or congregation of all those cohorts that led to discovery. So how do you get this funded piecemeal with the current mechanisms? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I moved to Finland, so. A <laughs> uh, short answer, anyone? So, so I, I mean, I, I, I think one of the upsides of working together for uh, academic health center is that you're not just, you know, we're not structuring this like you throw your data over the wall and then, you know, six months later a paper comes out. It, it's explicitly meant to be a community effort and it's explicitly meant to be an opportunity to exchange ideas and advance the science. Now, an academic health center might view understanding the biological basis of every human disease to be part of its mission. I, I might be comfortable arguing that that is what academic health centers should be doing, is thinking about not only how to treat people that get sick, but why people get sick in the first place. And so the line of argument in my mind is that this is an opportunity to join a community effort that will not only enrich the science, but improve the quality of science that you can do at your institution yourself. So, so that, that to me is, is a big justification and relates explicitly to how it fits in the mission for the institution itself. The other question of like, how do we get funders to change or shift? I mean, I think what's happening with all of us as at least a clear commitment for a large scale cohort project that is not going to be in a sense a piecemeal activity, but an actual sustained United States biobank effort that's a bit distinct because I, I think your question is more focused on the US landscape than some of the other ones. That is one way, uh, but I suppose part of the goal of this meeting is to figure out how we organize ourselves. If we buy into this vision and this mission and this goal, then how do we come together as a community to figure out things like funding and resourcing and how we you know, can work together to achieve the potential that genetics offers? So, I think yeah. one, one point I'd just like to make is that we need an international and not a national strategy. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think UK Biobank is a bad name uh, in the sense that it's perceived as being a UK resource and yet actually more than three quarters of the use is from outside the UK. And we need to start thinking internationally. So rather than it would be nice to have a Biobank in our population, I think we should be thinking about it would be important to have some very well characterized prospective cohorts in a number of very carefully selected populations where they would scientifically add the most value. Uh, and so um, there is a danger of a push towards every country wanting to have a large prospective cohort rather than thinking about where would it be most important to have a few really well characterized ones that would add internationally Okay, I would just add, medical centers in the U.S. cannot do their best job for their patients without this kind of international collaboration. We have patients whose genetics come from all over the world, and by sharing what we are learning in our own medical centers, we help to justify people in all of these other places sharing and working together with all of us to build out what we need for the entire world population, which we have in microcosm in the United States. We can't do our best jobs without that. And so if we can need to understand that the idea of building a biobank is, as Nancy says, not as a money-making opportunity. One of, one of the things that we have to keep in mind that as soon as, as, soon as the sequencing the cost of sequencing comes down and it becomes a clinical assay, then basically building a biobank isn't a specific activity. Hospital, Each and every hospital, every hospital, hospital becomes a biobank. So, so I think that a part of what we have to do is, is poli political lobbying, make sure that sequencing of genomes becomes a clinical assay and basically even today, it is substantially cheaper than doing a MRI scan of the brain. Mm -hmm. So can so we take our last question, otherwise I suspect we're not ever going to get to lunch. Um, but I hope that these threads will be picked up and continued throughout um, the rest of our two days. So I don't think we're closing the discussion by any way. So yeah, please do go ahead. Yeah, I've been standing and my legs are beginning to shake. I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry, what, what I kind tried. Of genetic, uh, <laughs> anyway. um, at the risk of being delusional, like you challenge us to be sometimes because as you are at the edge, 
What will it take to do a two million people cohort in Africa? Who's going to fund that? And um, how do we begin to even engage the healthcare infrastructure when it's in a lot of cases you, re you actually don't have a functioning one? And so if we are talking about going global and being international, I think we need to think out the box and how to engage these different parts of the world. We're probably going to have the same kind of issue in South America. And uh, so how do we do this? Uh, I think we have to address th that kind of issue. Otherwise, we will continue to, maybe five years down the road, we will continue to say, oh, we don't have diversity. Uh, we don't have how do we actually do it? We have done History Africa now. We know what it takes to actually begin to do this kind of work. But it's a completely different mindset if you're going to engage the healthcare infrastructure and have a cohort that is going to be alive and breathing and continue to enroll people. Uh, do we get out of the so-called traditional healthcare infrastructure and beginning to tackle things like cell phones? How do we deploy technology that in, they can free individuals and free physicians to actually be able to deliver on these kind of things that we are talking about. I think we really need to discuss that. Uh, otherwise, we won't be able to engage this part of the world that we want to. Amen. So I think we should call it um, lunchtime. So just from the organizers, when do you want everyone back? 1.15. 1.15, and I'd like to thank all of our speakers. Thank you very much. <laughs>